It's been two years since the Great Recession ended, but many in the U.S. still feel like they're in the thick of it. The unemployment rate remains stuck above 9%, and almost twice that for African-American men. Home foreclosures have continued. You can't explain inequality in the world by looking at poor people. And average real wages have actually fallen over the past year. If you had that attitude, you kind of think to yourself, well, there's something that poor people could do that would make themselves less poor. That's just not true. Across the country, local governments are dealing with budget deficits by slashing social programs that poor and working people rely on. There are eight different demonstrations taking place in New York City right now. This is one of them. Another one is just behind us. And they're all planning to converge on Wall Street because they want to make sure that their demands are heard. But in 2011, millionaires hold more wealth than ever before. $11.6 trillion to be exact. The reason poor people are poor is because there's another group of people, rich people, um, and powerful people, who generally have a lot of control over social policy. So here in New York City, thousands of people are calling for an alternative approach. Regulate the financial institutions responsible for the economic meltdown and tax the wealthy. And so, all the billionaires got bailed out, and all the poor people Preach we left up, with only a tear in our eyes. <laughs> The richest 1% of Americans make more than a fifth of the country's income and command 40% of its wealth. In 2007, the richest 10% of households captured half of the country's earnings, leaving the other 90% of the country to divvy up the rest. The marketing wizards here on New York's Madison Avenue have taken note. They used to aim their ads at middle-class American consumers. Now. If you're not earning at least $200,000 a year, you're not worth their effort. Wealth is more concentrated and the gap between the haves and the have-nots more extreme than it's been in almost a century. The last time inequality was this sharp was the period right before the Great Depression of 1929, the most severe economic crisis in US history. It led to the New Deal, a series of government programs to create jobs, reform the financial sector, and kickstart the economy. When the Great Depression came and then the reforms of the New Deal era, the income inequality narrowed and the income disparities and wealth disparities narrowed through the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Then things started to open up in the 70s and really exploded in the 1980s and afterward. So if one does a kind of graph of the share of the income earned at the top, uh, it starts very high in the early part of the 20th century. It goes down so that there's more equality in the middle of the last century. Then it starts to rise again. So we're back at what is sometimes called the second gilded age. How, in America, the land of opportunity where everyone is supposed to have an equal shot at rising to the top, did wealth become so concentrated and the country so unequal? To find some of the answers, you don't have to look further than the changes on Wall Street over the last four decades. Globalization brought new markets to those with enough surplus cash to invest. Here on the New York Stock Exchange, many made a killing. When the world's capital markets opened up, uh, opportunities for investment of wealthy people improved. The opening of China gave new investment opportunities. But at the bottom end of the income distribution, America's workers, and basically workers everywhere, suddenly were competing with millions, then tens, then hundreds of millions of Chinese workers and, uh, and lower paid workers in other emerging economies as well. So the evisceration of labor as a major force, um, the decline of manufacturing in the United States, and the rise of finance capitalism. The impact was profound. With growing competition from international labor markets, U.S. workers saw their employment prospects shrink and their wages go down. Investors, on the other hand, 
were able to grow their wealth, sometimes exponentially, on the financial markets. Starting in the 1980s, public policy in the United States became very, very congenial for rich people. Uh, so there was a lot of financial deregulation. The banks got what they wanted. Washington and Wall Street became very much intertwined. You know, back in the 60s, uh, the marginal tax rate on the highest earnings, like for every dollar that you made over about $1.2 million, you paid 91 cents in taxes, which is a lot. There were, of course, the famous uh, Reagan era tax cuts and then the Bush era tax cuts. And today, you know, you, you pay nowhere near that. You pay 30 to 40 cents on the dollar. And that's had a huge impact on the realignment of wealth. The irony is that while I would have expected that the markets might have widened the income inequality, that politics would have come in to, to narrow it by doing some income redistribution, the politics took this widened inequality and widened it still further because the rich not only became richer, they became a lot more politically powerful. On Capitol Hill, redistribution has never been a more contested term. As the U.S. government exceeds its current $14.3 trillion debt limit, lawmakers are playing out a bitter partisan drama over how to slash budget deficits. The economy is most likely going to be the defining issue in next year's presidential election. Republicans and Democrats are staking out their positions. We go back to Clinton-era tax rates, which is considerably higher than they are now, but we had a good economy in the Clinton year, years, so why would we be against that? Far to the left on the U.S. political spectrum, Democratic Congressman Keith Ellison champions a deficit reduction plan he calls the people's budget. We ask the richest Americans who benefit the most to do a little bit more, and um, we, uh, we, we got, we're getting America out of these wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we invest in our public schools, we invest in Medicare and Medicaid, and we, and we make the expenditures to actually have a stronger, more um, dynamic, more sustainable economy. I'm not a socialist. I never ran as a socialist. I don't believe it's the job of government to redistribute wealth. I just don't agree with the premise. Okay. Far to the right, Republican Congressman Todd Akin. What do you see as good, as, as sort of core to balancing the budget? Well. There are two things to get ourselves out of economic difficulty. The first is we have to cut spending, and the second is we have to grow the economy. So one of the things that you do is, is you have to get small businesses starting to hire people and have enough money to invest to develop their businesses. And that is by cutting the taxes, and particularly now the red tape, mm -hmm. that fall on the back of small businesses, the talk on the Hill is about an impending fiscal crisis and a national debt so out of control that it could lead to the end of American global economic supremacy. But the two congressmen's polarized positions reflect a long-standing political debate. What is the purpose of the federal government? And, um, and I really think that America is deeply divided on that question. If you take a look at what is it that everybody in politics in Washington, D.C. argues about, it boils down to what should the federal government do? That's what we fight about. To help resolve the deadlock, retired billionaire hedge fund manager Pete Peterson convened a summit with Washington's most prestigious think tanks to hash out possible solutions. We meet at a very pivotal and hopeful moment. Through his private foundation, he's invested $1 billion of his own fortune to battle deficit spending. The summit drew a number of political luminaries, past, it was one of my greatest one-liners, and people said, what great new idea did you bring to Washington when you became president? And I always said arithmetic. And present. If you try to tax your way out of this problem, you'll shut down the economy. More than anyone else, the chair of the House Budget Committee, so Republican Paul Ryan, age, has set the terms of the current budget the debate. The spending line is what is going up so fast. By the time my three kids are my age, instead of having government at 20% of GDP, it's at 40% of GDP. His plan would slash deficits by $4.4 trillion over a decade by cutting government support for health care programs for the poor and the elderly and benefits for retirees. So if we try to chase ever higher spending with ever higher taxes, 
Never, number one, we'll never catch up. And number two, I think we'll shut down our economy and compromise economic growth. Spending is the problem, not taxes. On the revenue side, Ryan wants to lower the top tax rate to 25 percent. That's 10 percent below the rate currently paid by the wealthiest Americans and U.S. corporations. When polled, most Americans say they want higher taxes for the wealthiest, cuts in defense spending, and believe that keeping the benefits of government-funded health and retirement programs is more important than cutting budget deficits. Those who earn over $250,000 a year are more likely than anyone else to believe they pay too much income tax. The majority of Americans are opposed to your plan. Does that not make it undemocratic? I'm not going to I would disagree with you. Why, why would you disagree uh, with So we've just tried asking Congressman Ryan whether his plan is an undemocratic, given the fact that the majority of the American people oppose cuts to so-called entitlement uh, spending. And I also asked him why he won't talk about tax burden for the richest country, the richest in the country, given the fact uh, that wealth is so concentrated. And the only answer I got was that my questions were rude. Ryan's plan emboldened House Republicans to create a crisis. They refused to allow Congress to raise the amount the U.S. government can borrow to pay its expenses unless Democrats agreed to cut deficits their way, reduce spending by gutting the social welfare system, and keep taxes for the wealthy low. As the August deadline approached, the U.S. government faced default, bond markets twitched, and Americans feared the consequences. President Obama moved right in compromise. Good evening. The result would be the lowest level of annual domestic spending since Dwight Eisenhower was president. In a deal hammered out at the 11th hour and sent to Congress for final approval, the U.S. president agreed to a first round of spending cuts worth $1 trillion over 10 years and promised that a bipartisan committee would decide on at least $1.5 trillion more in savings to come. In this stage, everything will be on the table. The deal cut the deficit without raising any taxes. I believe that we could have made the tough choices required on entitlement reform and tax reform right now, rather than through a special congressional committee process. But this compromise does make a serious down payment on the deficit reduction we need and gives each party a strong incentive to get a balanced plan done before the end of the year. It wasn't the first capitulation. President Obama ran for office on a promise to end the tax cuts enacted by his predecessor, George W. Bush, for households making $250,000 a year and more, roughly the top 4 percent. By 2008, the Bush tax cuts accounted for $1.7 trillion in U.S. budget deficits, and they disproportionately benefited the wealthiest. But at the end of 2010, in a deal with House Republicans, Obama extended the cuts for another two years, promising to end them next time. The shift disillusioned some of his base, and not only his less well-off supporters, as you might assume. Leo Hindery is one of them. He made his fortune in telecom, and he's now a managing partner at a private equity firm. I'm a Democrat. I'm a progressive Democrat. I worked very hard for the election of Mr. Obama to be president. He's one of some 200 self-professed patriotic millionaires who protested when Obama extended the tax cuts for the wealthy. I thought this promise was absolute, and yet in a, in a spirit of compromise, he gave it away. But he didn't get anything for it. Uh, we just simply further embedded this inequity. Uh, I think it's going to be much more difficult to fix it. Hindery doubts the outcome of the current budget debate will be much different. But I'm not optimistic. I would have been much more optimistic if President Obama had himself stood resolute on this issue. But when I argue against the Republican leadership, all they have to do is point their finger at my Democratic leadership and say, why do I have to listen to you? He didn't. As both Democrats and Republicans gear up for the 2012 presidential election, the race to raise money for campaign advertising is a driving force for both parties. And that means assuring potential donors, especially the biggest ones, that their interests will be well represented in Congress. Sadly, because of what's called our campaign finance rules, 
the extremely wealthy, whether they be the extremely wealthy corporation or the extremely wealthy individual, has an ability to influence Congress disproportionately to their real role in society. The Democratic Party, I'm just disappointed by because they bought into the same uh, potion to a large extent. Uh, they also raise campaign financing. Uh, while the Republicans do it mostly from big oil, uh, the Democrats do it from Wall Street, for example. So they too are on the campaign kick. It may help explain Obama's willingness to accommodate Republican positions. His budget proposals are actually closer to the Republican proposals than one would guess by all the screaming on the surface, and for good reason. He's after the same campaign financing that his political opposition is. He's not going to upset Wall Street in the year running up to his reelection. But in Washington, debates are often framed before they even reach Congress. Here, too, wealthy funders make big contributions. They pour hundreds of millions of dollars in grants and donations into Washington's think tank industry each year, entrusting them with determining what is considered to be sensible political discourse. Among the most well-known, the Koch brothers, Charles and David, the sixth and seventh richest people in the US. They made their fortune in oil and gas and owned the second largest private company in the country. Together, they're worth more than $40 billion. Among the organizations the brothers have funded, the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank that promotes minimal government. The Americans for Prosperity Foundation, whose advocacy wing ran trainings for Tea Party activists. The Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank. The George Marshall Institute, which promotes the work of climate change skeptics. And the Tax Foundation. I think that uh, uh, much of the talk about rising inequality in America um, is somewhat of an illusion. But Scott Hodge is the foundation's president. I, I think that President Obama often sees the economy as a fixed pie that gets divvied up among all of us. And I think there are many of those, like myself, who see the economy as a growing pie. So as the, as the economy expands and grows, we all benefit. The pie has been growing, but not equally. The pie's been growing, and there's one slice taken at the top, and then everyone else is sitting, they're not allowed close to the table. They're just watching that pie being eaten by the billionaires on Wall Street or the billionaires in, in the corporate sector, these CEOs. In trickle-down economics, uh, if you believe it, says that you should further enrich the wealthy that they will take their income and push it down into the rest of the economy. And it justifies all kinds of aberrant uh, behavior, aberrant tax policies. But it's not, it's not true. Uh, if you make a wealthy person wealthier, they're just wealthier. They don't spend any more. They don't buy anything. And uh, it was a charade. It was a, it was a fraud on the American people. Would you consider yourself to be an advocate for wealthy and educated Americans? <laughs> Um, well, I don't see it as my mission in life to go out and defend the rich. Um, what I do think is important is that we minimize the tax penalties on entrepreneurship and success and innovation and the people that uh, creatively drive the American economy. That really does sound like advocating for the interests of wealthy Americans. Yeah, uh, I, I, you can't help it. I mean, sometimes you just can't help those perceptions. There is a difference between today's super rich and the super rich of a century ago. Most don't inherit their fortunes anymore. They work for them. But although executives today are more likely to accumulate their own wealth than in the past, they also earn almost four times what they did in the 1970s. Wages for 90% of Americans have stayed the same. Still, the fact that the ranks of the wealthiest Americans are stacked with men and women who have made their own money has helped nurture the notion that success in America is democratic and accessible. Nowhere is that sense of meritocratic mobility more tangible 
than on the campus of one of the most elite Ivy League schools in the country. And then the cool thing is, all you have to do is tap redeem on the product, mm -hmm. and it gets added straight to your store savings card. And now when I go out and check out, it comes off automatically. At the Jason Gerwin is the founder of Pushpins, a smartphone application that lets shoppers redeem coupons electronically. It's his second startup, and he's just about to graduate from the MBA program here at Harvard Business School. The alumni um, system here is amazing. The access you get to people is incredible. Like, you'll email an executive at a top, co top company, and you'll get an email back, you know, 15 minutes later, you know, with an offer to talk, you know. Jason feels he's earned his membership in the international network of successful business people to whom Harvard Business School has awarded a degree. You don't come to this place, they don't just hand it to you. They don't just go and send you an invitation and come here. You know, you work very hard for what you get. Ivy League schools have become much more diverse since the civil rights struggles of the 60s and 70s forced them to open up. But the sense that students have merited their place here may obscure the inequalities that skew who can get a top-notch education, the key to a well-paid job. 85% of undergraduate students come from families that make more than the U.S. median of $50,000 a year. A Harvard middle-income family earns between $110,000 and $200,000. And so what you have is a very wealthy group of people who don't really explain their position relative to their heritage, the fact that their families have always gone to Harvard or Columbia, um, but instead by the fact that they're just better, they're more meritocratic. Um, and this means that they both explain their own position by their own personal hard work, and they explain other people's positions, the people at the bottom, as a product of the fact they're not as talented, they're not as skilled, and so therefore, it's just this small group of people who happen to go to these institutions who are best equipped to make decisions about the economy, best equipped to make decisions about the ways in which politics should work, because they're smarter, harder working, um, and they know best. Congratulations. Whatever background they've come from, these graduates are now part of a network that gives them access to powerful circles of opportunity and influence and they have better odds of becoming one of the top 1% than they did before. Jason believes that if he does make it, it will benefit the other 99% as well. If it was me, I would want the people who've been able in the path to show that they can turn money into more money to keep on doing that. Because if you can create that chain of events, that's what's gonna make us competitive on the grand scale. It's not me giving 10% you know, of my wealth back to you know, the economy, additional wealth back to the economy in order to support these entitlement programs. Wouldn't you rather me take that 10% of wealth and turn it into you know, 100 times that? I think that benefits everyone. And so we have this very sort of ubiquitous uh, theme of American life, of the American dream, the capacity to get ahead, we love stories of rags to riches, um, and we see them as being quintessentially American. The problem is, is that though this is very much part of our cultural narrative of the ways in which we understand ourselves, it's not true. Um, every European country except the UK, Japan, every other developed nation in the world has more mobility than we do. But since it's so much a part of the way in which we talk about ourselves all the time, we obscure um, just how little mobility there is and just how much class matters. On the streets, the people to whom class matters most are starting to raise their voices. But will they be heard? In some Ivy League universities and executive suites, the outlook is not optimistic. Well, they better worry because this degree of inequity will ultimately lead to social upheaval. Uh, it, it's that acute. But the politicians are not listening. They're listening to the lobbies. They're listening to the wealthy people. We've got the disconnect. The United States will look a lot like it looked 100 years ago or a lot like much of the world looks. And how does it look? Where a very, very small group controls an enormous amount of the political and economic power. 
and a very, very large group suffers. 